Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Designing Academic Libraries for Modern Human Behavior, which is sponsored by Agati Furniture and Tape Architects. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. Along the right-hand side, you will see a Q&A panel and a chat panel. If you don't, you can click the buttons labeled Chat and Q&A in the upper right corner of the screen to activate the panel. Please use the Q&A panel to submit the questions to our speakers. At the end of the presentation, they will take a few minutes to answer your questions, so please do send them in throughout. If you experience any technical issues, please use the chat panel to let me know, and I'll troubleshoot the issue with you privately. Today, we're using the hashtag ACRLChoiceWebinars during and after this event, so if you have another screen handy, shout out to us. We're at choice underscore reviews on Twitter. Also note that we are recording today's program, and everyone who registered will receive a follow-up email with a link to the archived version. Our presenters today are Joe S. Agati, Jr., Director of Design at Agati Furniture, and Jeff Hoover, Principal at Tape Architects in Boston. And with that, we're ready to get started. So over to you, Joe. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, like uh, uh, Mark was just saying, uh, my name is Joe Agati. I am with Agati Furniture. I'm just going to give you a quick two-minute background, and I'm going to turn it over to Jeff uh, uh, on myself. Um, so I joined the family business about five years ago. Uh, my background is in product design. I have a degree in what's called industrial designs. and uh, I don't design factories, that's the common question I get. Um, it's a it's, uh, degree centered around kind of product design, development, and research. Um, I spent the first part of my career designing toys for a company here on the west side of Chicago. Most people are familiar with it, it's uh, Radio Flyer. Um, they're known for the red, red wagons. Um, I actually worked, I only worked on one wagon project there, um, but I was on the foot, foot to floor and ride on team. And it was a great experience because we shared a very we shared similar similarities in how we design and develop products. Um, it was always the intent of observing human behavior and trying to design something that fits in with that. For example, every one of these products that you see here was designed out of watching either a parent interact with the product or a parent and child interact with the product and designing a behavior to fit in with that versus trying to mold behavior. We would rather work with it. And so, like I said, I joined the family business about five years ago and love being here ever since. So I'm going to turn it over to Jeff now. Well, thank you, Joe. I, I'll take over here just a second. And I'll bring a um, architectural perspective to the discussion about designing for human behavior. Uh, I'm a principal and um, a library design director at Tepe Architects, where the focus of our practice has been the planning and design of public and academic libraries for the past 35 years. Personally, I have been actively involved in library design continuously for uh, the past three decades with three to eight active projects at any one time. Obviously, we have seen a tremendous shift in the library services and library spaces over the course of this time since, well, 30 years ago, there were no computers in libraries, and today many would say that a library can exist within a computer. So working with our clients, we spend a lot of time considering how the physical library for the next generation will be configured and uh, configuring it for continued relevance and how we can shape the, these libraries to support the spectrum of activities that are going to happen there in the future. So uh, for library architects and librarians planning future library buildings, the work has really much less to do with digital words and digital worlds um, and more to do with creating places that support individual human interaction or in introspection and collective human interaction. Uh, still, books continue to be the uh, brand identity for libraries. 
But for most academic libraries, certainly, books are not the fundamental attraction. In the digital information age, technology for information access, information mashup or assembly, um, and content creation has been and in many ways continues to be an important draw. However, of course, online access to the library's digital holdings means that students do not need to come to the library to access, use, or create information. Ubiquitous technology reduces or eliminates the need to come to the library for certain students or certain academic disciplines. So replacing collections with information technology does not create the new library paradigm. Uh, as we examine the library in an age characterized by this proliferation of information access technologies, we see a different library diagram evolving. Initially, uh, there were the books, and the books and information were rare and precious and therefore central. Uh, the library protected the books and the people were accommodated peripherally. Probably this is not a reasonable future draw and, and, and certainly not the right spatial character for the current or next generation of students. Technology by itself is also probably not the right future draw. If I can access a computer at Burger King here, halfway down to the subway in New York City, then technology alone is not going to be the, the future. Even if the library is the place with the most powerful computers and the greatest bandwidth on campus, technology alone does not define the current or future library. Successful libraries transition from collection-centric to people-centric concepts and from information access to information use. The quality of space for students is, it, it, to establish this quality of space for students, increasingly important to attract them to the physical library, drawn to space that is configured to meet their needs as individuals or groups, to be comfortable, focused, inspired, and productive, and then surrounded by the tools and resources they need to use and share information. So collections are opening up to make way for student space and libraries everywhere. Um, perhaps not configured like this per se, but in ways that are configured to create some spatial delight. You know, people space is thematically central and successful libraries need to shape enticing space, become the preferred destination place on campus, support a community of learners, and do it with access to resources and production materials. How? Well, these are the things we work with as architects, shape, light, size, color, and then variation. Using this variety of design tools, we can create the quality space that's needed for students and people in general. This approach is fundamental to the Information Commons initiative that has already transformed so many libraries. So sort of it begs the question, what is an Information Commons? Perhaps that is as complex a question as how would you define a library? Um, sometimes it's easiest to define a thing by identifying what it is not. It is not a computer lab with sofas and coffee. Um, there's a 2011 article called From Learning Commons to Learning Outcomes. And in there they, they, they clarify that the lab use, of course, is, is declining while information commons use is increasing. And the ratio, according to that study, was by, by about 10 to 1. The Commons concept draws more students to the library. It has a completely different look and feel. In, a, in that 2011 article, Sheff Sheffield University confirmed that the success of the Commons model is not technology, but social. Social ambiance fuels ad hoc collaboration. Uh, this Im image is of the uh, Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising in, in their library space. So success depends on shaping space to support people using technology in pursuit of learning. As we look at what are the ingredients, the uh, components of a commons, first of all, uh, there are activities, uh, activities you know, from individual study, library research, interface with research assistants and interface with other students for group study, but also for socializing, eating and drinking, and, uh, and of course computing. And then the next ingredient we need to add is facilities, uh, facilities to support the activities are things like workstations, individual and collaborative workstations and multimedia workstations, uh, but also a variety of seating options to support different learning styles uh, and visually transparent yet acoustically opaque group study rooms, presentation practice rooms and places with embedded technology as well as places devoid of technology. 
The, uh, the third essential ingredient in the information commons is the staff, um, not just the research assistants um, that we characterize as part of traditional libraries, but also IT help, writing help, advising, uh, uh, career counseling, et cetera. These are important uh, ingredients to make it all come together. And when we get these ingredients together in the proper proportions, a synergy is created and we have something that functions as a uh, information commons. It takes a critical mass of students to make it happen, but it also takes a character of space. It needs all three of these things to really work well. Interestingly enough, of course, it doesn't necessarily need uh, the brand identity of the library. It doesn't need books per se to be a successful information commons. Um, but in defining that commons, uh, whether we're, we're actually, if we're talking commons or not, we're talking about a spectrum of spaces to create an overall enticing library environment, not only providing the large wow factor spaces, but a variety of places arranged to create layers of separation and connection um, to allow disparate activities to be ongoing simultaneously and, and different demographics to be able to effectively use the library concurrently. So spaces of various sizes and characters support different kinds of activities um, for clusters of students working together collectively to student clusters working alone together, uh, to students seeking isolation for focused concentration. Also, size matters. Grand spaces suggest uh, a formal behavior, um, and we can encourage different behavior by manipulating the scale and size and shape of space. Uh, spaces of the same shape, but different size or scale will elicit completely different behavioral responses, as you can see from these two images, you, you would behave differently walking into one room or the other. Uh, large space suggests, uh, and, and independent, uh, independent of its size, it suggests uh, act, group activities, group events, but it will not be attractive uh, for individuals or small groups. Smaller scaled space, especially when contrasted against the larger space, will have appeal to individuals and small groups and become a locus for conversation. Other adjacent spaces can be uh, alone together opportunities. And I think if you look here on the left, we see this variety. We see enclosed and open group uh, spaces as well as some alone together spaces at the rectangular tables, et cetera. Um, variation also matters. Uh, it's not just what we do with the size of the, the space and plan, but also in its height, the third dimension. Ceiling height is related to social distance. Low ceilings characterize an intimate space, and high ceilings create a formal space. Variation matters. It emphasizes differences and allows choice. Uh, Christopher Alexander quoted here, made a lifelong study of vernacular spaces worldwide and identified ones that really work for people, uh, would make good people space, and extracted the principles in his book, A Pattern Language, and the quote here, a building in which the ceiling heights are all the same is virtually incapable of making people comfortable. It's important because fundamentally what we need to do is to make people comfortable in these library environments. Of course, uh, light also matters. It shapes space, um, but it also influences behavior and comfort. Uh, we understand from clinical studies that not only do people enjoy daylight environments more, but learning retention is improved in daylight environments uh, relative to comparably bright, artificially lit spaces. Um, and light from two sides is a delight. Uh, light from more sides increases spatial delight uh, exponentially. So light from three sides or four sides makes truly delightful spaces. And these are the kind of places that people will be drawn to, so we need them in a library. Uh, uh, relative to natural light, it's important to recognize solar orientation. We get light from the north, uh, we get a different kind of light from the south, and for libraries, this can mean locating active areas perhaps on the south side of the library and contemplative areas on the north. Just take it into consideration. Uh, as I said, uh, shape matters. Uh, basic shape begins to determine the character of a space uh, whether, and whether it'll be a desirable place to stay or a place to pass through. Uh, shape can be used to create a sense of motion. A triangular form can suggest and support dynamic activity. Uh, within this simple plan, the overlay of the circle on the triangular arrests the motion and reinforces a place to be, a place to dwell within that space. Rectangular shapes can also be used to create a sense of motion through a space. 
Um, again, a uh, elliptical space can be used to designate a special place to stop motion and really to define a, uh, a place to stay, a place to spend some time in the library. Uh, traditionally, we were advised that the closer to a square that we make our library plans, the more efficient it will be. Uh, after all, odd shapes don't accommodate book stacks well, and non-sequential arrangements of stacks and peed ordered layout of large collections, etc. But we need to shape space that is attractive for and useful to people and create a human scale, a sense of enclosure, a sense of comfort, as well as function. So it takes uh, more than accommodating the books. Uh, using more rounded forms to make enclosures and define comfortable destination places is a, a, a timeless technique and works really well. Also, the shape of the learning environment can either support collaborative discourse or detract from it. So that becomes an important thing to consider in uh, shaping of, for instance, uh, classroom environments or instruction spaces. Uh, shaping the activity within the space is important. A traditional classroom model is hierarchical by nature and can limit interactive discourse. Um, the uh, ellipse shape, by contrast, allows for the teacher and the students to see the eyes of everyone around the table. This encourages open discussion, promotes good listening skills such as eye contact, body language, and responsive mannerisms. With minimal intervention from an instructor, students can lead the discussion and determine the flow of a conversation. You know, Edward Harkness explored this model for classroom instruction in the 30s, and uh, we can employ the concept for instruction rooms and other spaces where we want to encourage inclusive participation uh, throughout the library, or, or we can avoid it where we want environments for focus, individual concentration. So uh, pulling these principles of shaping space uh, together in this example of the Norfolk State University Library, uh, we can see spaces that for different kinds of student behavior and how they're accommodated and orchestrated within the library plan. And yeah, here's how they look. Um, we can also begin to see within these the uh, the way furniture, furnishings can be used to affect human behavior. So soon I'll be turning the presentation over to Joe Agati. Um, so in conclusion, I think that's some We've reviewed some of the factors that we as architects consider as we work with our library clients to shape space for library patrons and their activities, uh, recognizing that as we do so, we are creating spaces that shape human behavior as well. And Joe, I think that's a good place for me to hand it over to you as we get into the details. Oh, thanks, Jeff. Um, so I just want to do, uh, just kind of tag on to what I was saying earlier. So, like I said, I came into Agati about five years ago, and, you know, over the years, Agati has, you know, take pride in developing an innovating product, and a lot of that development innovation comes around some of the principles Jeff's talking about and what we observe people doing in these spaces. So all these products over the years have driven by challenges, issues, and behaviors that we've observed in the space. And so I want to kind of get now, you know, Jeff's given us this great kind of macro view, and now we're going to kind of get down to more into the little bit of micro. So when we look at human behavior, we look at it here at Agati from four kind of basic principles. So you have a space component to it, and you have this feeling we want to create um, with the furniture. We call it a haven feeling. Um, and then we have to think about the durability of the furniture and longevity of it, and then the comfort. So the top two here are more psychological principles that we have to deal with, creating a feeling, sense, senses, things like that. Uh, and the bottom two are the much more functional side, comfort, durability, longevity, just the practical side of working in what we call like a public space. So talking about the psychological side, so people have this kind of innate craving to want to feel comfortable and secure. Um, we here at Agati, we talk about it, and we think about people back in like the primitive time of you know you're living in a cave, you have a tribe, and belonging to a tribe or society or culture gives you a sense of purpose, a sense of comfort. Because at that time, if you didn't have those protections, whether it's the cave, whether it's the group, or whatever, it meant it was life and death. So it was your survival. That's how we survived as a species uh, throughout the ages. Right now, those primitive instincts still exist in us, and they're brought up 
in new ways. So stress brings out the fright or flight or fr uh, flight or fright instinct, where we have you know where the body will produce chemicals related to stress, which are fine in short bursts, so we can escape the you know the cheetah that wants to hunt us down. Uh, but now it's brought out from you know my boss nagging me, emails, space being congested, being violated. It creates this sensory overload and it taps into that kind of primal instinct in an unnatural way. So that's where our stress starts to come from. So we have this craving to want to get back to these spaces and we see this with kids all the time. They like to create their own little environments. Uh, obviously, I'm more of a engineering kind of hands-on side, so I spent a lot of my youth building forts out of pillows and things that I would find around the house. Um, and it was always great sitting in that fort. It was my area. I felt really comfortable. You know, it was made for my kind of size and proportion. That makes a big difference going along to those kind of psychological feelings that we want to portray. And it taps into that kind of survival instinct that we, that we have in us. So looking at this, so where, where we come into play, we, you know, we look at it from this level. And it, obviously the architecture, what Jeff's talking about, plays a huge component in that. Probably, you know, makes up 80% of how someone's going to feel in a space. Um, but it's not all there. You have to have the last, what we call the last 20%. It needs to be down to the product level. So you can have these great spaces. If you're not addressing it on the product level, it falls apart. Vice versa, you could have great product, um, but if you're not talking about the principles like Jeff is talking about, the, the whole area is gonna fall far apart as well. They kind of need to work hand in hand with each other. So, because we're experts on product, we're gonna focus in on that. So the first principle we're gonna get into is um, space. So when we talk about space, we look at it in this personal bubble, and I'm sure everybody's you know encountered this, talked about this, heard about this, um, where we have this kind of zone around us. And so that zone can be pushed or pulled how well we know people. So for example, I give people the example of, you know, if you ever live in a city, you take public transportation, and I've experienced this before, it's late, late at night, I'm on the bus, there's literally nobody on the bus, and somebody gets on, and I'm not sure why, every seat is open, they sit right next to me. <laughs> and it's a little off-putting, and it's not the end of the world, but it's like, why sit, why could you sit everywhere else, why are you sitting right next to me? And it's like, I don't know this person, you know, it, it creates this kind of tension in me. Now, if it was my wife, she walked on the bus, if she didn't sit next to me, it would be a little weird. Okay, what's going on? Is she angry at me? Did I not do the dishes? Something like that. Um, so how we, you know, uh, the level of relationship will dictate that space. Um, so the more we know, the more intimate space we're, we're willing in that big in and that bubble will shrink. The less we know, the bigger that bubble gets. And it can be culturally driven as well. Um, here, you know, what we just kind of talk about 12 inches is a good rule of thumb. As you start to get more than, you know, closer than 12 inches to a stranger, it starts to become weird. It's, it's why, it was this, why is this individual so close to me? So when we think about that, we want to think about that as we as we design the product and furniture because we want to get the best utilization out of it. And so we see this in table design, especially old traditional library tables. You get six people at it, six chairs, long table, very common. And so I'm sure that everybody has seen this seating pattern. You get one person that sits right in the middle. Why do they sit in the middle? Because they have all of these all this stuff around them. They got a table, they got two chairs on their side, they got three chairs across them, they got these all these great barriers to block out all the things that want to attack them and stress them out or whatever. Um, and then you get to a critical mass and all the tables are used up and then people will now sit at the ed edges. So why do they sit there? Well, they still have some mass in between them and another person. They're not actually sitting across from everybody, so they're not really violating their space. Um, and they, they have appropriate amount of, you know, chair, table space in between them. So there's still a level of comfort there. And then you get to a critical mass again, and then so on and so forth in the cycle routines. And it's not that people won't sit next to each other, but you have to get such a critical mass in the space to use it the whole table. You only get there very, very frequently, if ever. So what happens is you, you get this pattern, uh, which is most common, and you not getting the functionality out of this furniture. So you have this table and you're not really utilizing that footprint of that space and you may be paying more for some of this stuff than you need to. So when we look at that, we see this over and over again, we say, okay, we can't, it's really, really, really difficult to change human behavior. How do we design the product to fit with it? So a lot of people do wavy tables. We do a table called a zigzag table. 
Um, and it's designed to fit into this principle, and it's great because nobody sits across from each other. And one big factor here is that we're breaking this plane of a table surface. When you push someone beyond this plane, now it's psychologically built this bubble around them. Now I'm in this object, I feel much more secure, and you will get people that will sit next to each other. And a common mistake that I see people make is they sit people at the peaks of the arcs. This is, you know, going against kind of what we're observed is that, you know, now you've just thrust somebody out in this space. They have no barriers, no nothing. You've crowded them next to another person. It, you know, you, these are the last, if you, if you do have seats there, these are the last seats are filled. And they're not waste of space. They just you need to be used differently. So what we tell people is this is now the area that when you have these in a row, two individuals can then work to each other. So the two seats on the bottom of the image here, these people could be working independently or let's say they do need to collaborate or work on something together, now that's the zone in which they do it. Um, so they have the flexibility to kind of achieve um, both styles of work patterns there. And this can be achieved in other ways. You don't have to do zigzag wavy tables. You can achieve it just through some, like just how you place your cafe tables. So this is a very common thing. A lot of times people like to crowd a bunch of seats around the cafe tables, it becomes cluttered. Like once again, it's kind of a waste of chairs. You can still get the same kind of seating pattern just by you know arranging smaller pieces of furniture. Okay, so the next principle we want to talk about is haven. Haven is similar to space. It's taking space one step further and creating this really comfortable feeling. We equate it to like wrapping like a warm blanket around you or a, a nice warm towel after you get out of the shower. So we first started noticing this principle with uh, with a product called our Hampton Banquet. Uh, we've been making banquets for, for a long time, and this is a shot from uh, uh, University of Florida. Um, this is probably close to 10 years old now. And what we noticed is that people love to sit in the banquet. Every time we go there, banquets are filled up. It's great. I love to see people utilizing the product. And we noticed that that feeling kind of continued and continued. So, as, so this is a newer shot. This is Slippery Rock University. This has taken probably about a year or two ago. Um, and you still, the principle is kind of always there. Ten years, two years ago, it's continued on. And what we noticed, and what I think what a lot of people get confused by, and I want to just make a note here, this is we're seeing a lot of social work. So people like to work socially. You can use these for collaboration. Most often when people are utilizing these spaces, they're working as a group, not necessarily on the same problem, just, but just working because I want to be next to somebody. I want to you know, be in kind of a social atmosphere. Same thing here, not necessarily group work, but working together because as you can see, you know, someone's working on an iPad, two people are eating their lunch, they're working, they're hanging out. It's much more of a social atmosphere. So let's go back to this image real quick. So we noticed that, okay, yes, there's something about the gang cats, people love them. There's one problem with this image. You have a seating area for four to six people and only individuals are working there. So we just talked about this in tables. We were recreating the problem right here in seating. So obviously we don't want to be doing that. So we're trying to figure out, okay, we see this again. This is at North Park University here in the Chicago area uh, taken about a year ago. So, you know, great space, comfortable seating. Um, it's highly utilized, but, according, you know, but looking at this image, you know, it's designed for more people. Maybe not the most effective use of it. So we try to figure out, okay, well, there's study carols in these places. Why aren't they using the carol? That's a single user workspace. It provides privacy, but there's an element that it's missing. And so when we look at it, the carol, while it provides privacy, doesn't provide security. It doesn't get to that level that we call that haven experience, where you can feel really comfortable in the piece of furniture. So when we look at that and say, well, what do we need to do? Well, we need to put the person, like we put them inside the table in the zigzag, we need to put them inside the carol. So it's turning the carol 90 degrees and literally building it so it's now it's more of a space that you're inside of at this point. Um, so now you've got your privacy and your security. So now this is really giving somebody a space that they can focus in and hunker down and really get work done. And these people spend it, tend to spend 30, 60, you know, 90 minutes uh, working in these environments. And so you can get them from, um, you can, we can do them in rectangular, more organic circular shapes, and it still will provide the same, same kind of functionality that you're looking for. So as you can see here, now we're taking that feeling of that haven and bringing it from group on the left side here and bringing it down to the individual, but still speaking to that uh, psychological feeling that you want to capture. 
So moving on. So now we've talked about the functional or psychological. We're going to move into uh, the functional side, comfort. And comfort plays into space and haven. You know, you can't have, you can't achieve that like haven feeling without having the furniture be comfortable to work at and sit in. So when we break this down, we look at this um, in like four different groups here. So you have a lounge type work pattern, you have uh, a long work long pattern, uh, and we'll, we'll get into more of these here in a little bit, and then you have a work lounge pattern, and then you have this quick work, this high, this high top uh, work pattern. These, these are, you know, there's, and there may be a little subtlety to these, you know, but these are kind of the four big groups that we observe, um, especially in academic libraries. So the work lounge. So usually we tell people when they're looking at, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the lounge, when people are looking at the lounge, you want to stick to a 20-20 rule. So what does that mean? So um, the lounge chairs tend to sit deeper and more on an incline. So you have a 20 degree incline on the back and you got 20 inches deep on the seat. And so this is meant for a work pattern that is, it's a little counterintuitive. A lot of times it's used for quicker things, you know, a little more social gatherings. Hey, I gotta stop between class, 15 minutes. I'm just gonna hang out, check my phone, maybe pop my laptop open real quick. Um, and then you'll jump to much longer term things. Hey, I'm gonna sit there and I'm gonna read. It's not a work activity though, and we'll get to that in a second here. And these are the types of products that you'll see that kind of fit into that lounge category. Um, the next one is the work pattern. So the work pattern follows an, a, what we call a 10-18-18 rule. Um, like the lounge, um, there's a certain degree that kind of makes sense for, the, for, for this type of work, and that's a 10 degree. So it's much more vertical on the back, and that's meant to put you in the right posture when you're working on a laptop, writing a paper, things like that. And then the seat is a uh, little higher and a little shallower, so you're going to go only 18 inches deep on the seat. And the reason is that because you want to be more popped up and forward while you're working. And this principle applies. So we get a lot of requests and we do a lot of standing height tables. And they're, they're becoming more and more common. Um, and I think there's, there's also another psychological factor there that when people sit up high, they, are, they feel more comfortable because now you're at the same head level versus if you're sitting at a traditional height table, now people walk by, they're standing over top of you. It's, it's not a secure feeling. That being said, the principles still apply. You still need to have the back support even though it's off the ground, that footrest is still 18 inches from, roughly 18 inches from the, uh, from the seating surface. So you're still putting the same posture, you're just up another 12 inches off the ground. So next thing I wanna talk about, and this is this hybrid, this work lounge. Um, and this is where I find the most, uh, the most problems uh, with, with furniture and, and, and the type of work patterns that people are, are pairing them with. So the work lounge has the same support in the back and people get thrown by the lounge. The lounge portion is not the deep reclined seat that you want to capture, it's the soft part of the seat. So you still want to have the same work ergonomic setup, just with the plush lounge feel. And that's usually the difference that people don't bring over. So it's not a lounge chair, it's, it's definitely more of a pull-up chair, but you're just pulling over the kind of the plush cushion part of the lounge. So as you can see here, if you see on the left-hand side here, this is the work lounge. It's in the same proportion as you know, what would be the pull-up chair versus the lounge chair. And this is the problem right here. You're at, a, you're at a lower seat, it's more reclined, and when you go to work, your back is never even touching the back of your chair. If you're gonna do this, don't even bother putting it back on the chair, you're wasting the money. Because it's never, someone's not gonna sit there and put their back on that. You really wanna have that back pulled up and, in, and up against them to really engage them. And then they can kind of sit in, it takes tensions off the shoulders, it, let, it allows you to focus. So these type, of work, uh, these type of ergonomic positions tend to lead themselves to longer activity work. Someone's gonna kind of hunker down on this, 30 minutes, usually minimum. They can go 60, 90 minutes, it depends. Uh, but it's usually not the quick sit because you're gonna have to take the bag off, pull the laptop out, pull books out, Whatever it is, it's usually a longer activity. And these are the type of pieces of furniture that you'll find that would fit into that type of category. So the last thing I want to touch on is we're talking about, we talked about standing height or high tables as far as the sitting activity. If it's just a standing table, it's really meant for quick work. And usually standing tables, 39, 42 inches is what we're talking. If it's just standing, we tend to go 42. And like I said, 5, 10, 15 minute work. You know, it's not good to sit all day long, um, but it's also not good to stand all day long. 15 minutes at a time is, is, 
is usually what's recommended. Standing much more, much longer than that is also not good for your back as well. And these are the type of things. It's usually the higher table, um, higher tables that you're going to see. So when we look at this as the way time lays out, and the reason why I, 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 I'm talking about time is that you want to think about that in, in, in the space setting. So you don't want to put long-term furniture next to short-term furniture. So if you have like a quiet study area around the peripherals and then you put like, you put a lounge area like in between that, that could be distracting because now you have quick traffic moving through a quiet study area. So you may want to reverse that. The quiet study area should maybe be the center and on the peripherals, you know, people are able to come in and out quickly and not disturb what other people are doing. So when we think about that and we think about the types of furniture and work patterns, it's good to consider how much time and what people are going to be doing there. Um, so as you can see on the lounge, you know, you can go from 10 to 15 and you can jump. You'll jump from the 60 to 90, but usually there's not an in-between. So if someone's going to say, hey, I'm going to hunker down and I'm going to read a book. For the academic settings, I don't recommend a lot of lounge set up for the 60 to 90 minute. Most people, because when they're going to be hunkering down, they're mostly going to be doing some type of work. The longer term lounge is better for the public libraries because people will come in and use that space, uh, maybe not as much for work compared to the academic area. Okay, so the last principle uh, I want to talk about is durability. So here at Agati, we make durable furniture. We're known for that. We've been designing for the library, the public space for, you know, I think my dad started the company 30 years ago. Um, so we're well versed in that. And with that, the biggest problem with designing for students in the public space is the students themselves. They will abuse the furniture. And it's not because they're mean and they like to abuse things. It's just natural human behavior. When it's something we don't own, we don't always take personal pride in it, and we just abuse it more. It, and I see it in my office here, and I have wonderful employees. And it's just the fact that they, they have a sense of ownership to some things, but not a sense of ownership to some things. And it's not that they're intentionally abusive. It's just part of human nature. So we just have to keep that in mind as we're designing these spaces because we're not going to change that behavior. It's going to be there. So we just need to take that into consideration. So we look at things on the scale of abuse. So we think of like at the bottom end of the scale, you have the spots, the quiet, comfortable environment, very plush. And on the other end, you have a prison yard. And we tend to work in the area, maybe not full prison yard, but pretty close to it, depending on the, the institution. Like law libraries, you know, they're, they're not as, they're, sometimes the students are so rough and tumble. Undergraduate libraries that are 24-7 are heavily, heavily used in its heavily uh, abused spaces. So we just take that into consideration as we're working on this stuff. And also, too, thinking about money and time. Most institutions only get so much money over so much time. So when you're, if you're only going to get money every 10 years, you really have to say, how do I make sure that furniture is going to look great after 10 years um, or 20 years or, you know, it, it just depends. You're only going to get so much money over so much time. So thinking in those, I, you know, it, it, it could take me hours to go into furniture construction and things like that, but I want to just give you guys some kind of quick subjective um, Furniture tests and considerations as you're as you're evaluating pieces, just so you know, okay, was well, this really going to hold up in my space? So there's there's five things that I want to kind of talk about here. So the first thing being, um, we call it the shake and weight test. Tables will have movement. The more movement they have, the long, the the less life you're going to get out of them. Um, you know, I pride ourselves on making very durable tables, but even my most durable tables have some movement to them. Um, so, you know, give them a push. If they push back, great. It's going to hold up forever. <laughs> if you're getting some movement on it, like if you start getting much more of a quarter than a quarter of an inch of movement, it's probably not going to work for you because think about it. You're in a high traffic area. You have a table that moves. Someone's got their open water bottle. Someone bumps it. Then all of a sudden, you know, water's everywhere. Maybe it gets in electronics. It's, it's a problem. Um, and then we also have the weight. So considering the, what weight is going to be on these tables. We ran into issues where tables were sold and, and placed as study tables originally. Unfortunately, you know, because it's a long period of time, they then converted into computer tables. Well, and they did okay, but what we realized is that you have to take into consideration that, okay, if it's a study table one day and computer table the next day, computers weigh a significant amount. And when you put eight computers on a table, that's a lot of weight. And that table starts to act like a tuning fork. 
and will, will exacerbate any problem. So the table already wobbles just a little bit. As you put more and more weight on it, it's just going to compound that. So just something to consider there with the called the shake and weight test. So the next thing is the button back test. So I tell everybody, you got to test drive the chairs, whether it's a lounge chair, work chair, side chair, stool, whatever, you got to test drive it. And test drive it with the activity in mind. So how does it feel? Do you feel comfortable? So if it's a lounge, oh, I love this lounge chair, you know, but it's going to pair it with a table. Well, it could sit great, but now it's paired with a table and I'm going to work at a computer. Pretend to work at the computer. Where's your back at? How does your butt feel? Okay, you're going to start to see, okay, this is not lining up to the work pattern. It's a lounge chair. It's in an open space. Oh, my God, it sits great. I'm just going to nestle in here, read a book. Hey, that's probably the perfect chair for you. So you got to test drive it. It's really hard to look at these things on a computer screen and know how they're going to feel. Next thing is heavier is better. I know it sounds silly. The more things weigh, most likely the more durable they're going to be. You know, it comes down to little things. You know, a thinner gauge of steel is not going to last long as a heavier gauge of steel. You know, sometimes it's like, oh, it's a thinner gauge of steel, and you know, but it's heat treated, so it's more, you know, it's it's more durable. Yes, okay, possibly, but more often than not, you probably need to go a gauge or two higher. So if you're looking at the very lightweight, elegant designs, which are beautiful, and I love them as a designer, the reality is that in these spaces, they're just not going to last. You have to look at something more robust and something as simple as just. Picking it up, if it weighs a lot, most likely it's going to hold up. And the last thing I'm going to go into, and it gets a little more complicated, especially in the academic spaces, and we see this more, is mobility. So mobility, there's two factors. There's things um, bumping into it and then power considerations. So things that have wheels on it are mobile, and they move. That's the problem. And when they move, they will bump into things. So it's not that we shouldn't design things that are mobile. There are spaces that totally call for mobile. Uh, furniture. When we do that, we just have to take that into consideration. How is this going to bump, interact with the space? You know, if it's a wood table, you know, if it's a table with wood edges, I, I wouldn't recommend putting casters on it. Those edges are going to get pretty chewed up. Um, if it's something, if it's something like that, you know, PVC that's going to hold up much more. Wheels with casters on them. This is always a big debate that I have with clients. Casters are, um, sorry, casters that lock are not always your friend. So you would think, oh, well, it rolls a little bit when someone touches or sits on it. We should put locking casters on it. And yes, that's true. That will that will help that. The problem that you run into is that people don't unlock the casters. So if you have two, three, four locked casters, it might as well as if you don't have them on there at all. And they're going to drag them, and then they could potentially break. They could ruin the carpet, things like that. So it's a fine balance. Um, it's not that we don't we don't recommend doing any locking casters, but it's really not across the board that we should do them. Like I don't usually recommend them on chairs because people tend to move the chairs a lot more than they move the tables, and they 99% of the time do not unlock the casters. They just assume, oh, the caster's not working. I'm just going to keep dragging it, keep dragging it, keep dragging it. And then the next part is the with mobile is the power. It's really difficult to put power into mobile furniture. And power usage and consumption is not coming down. I'll, I'll talk about that here in a minute. Um, it can be done. It's not always recommended. Because the second you move it, you're, you have a very high likelihood of breaking that. It may not happen the first time. It may not happen the second time. But it will break. So mobile and power aren't your best friends. Now, this is difficult because these spaces are requiring more and more power. We're carrying more devices with us. Um, and I'll talk here in a minute about some potential solutions that people can look at to address this. So the next thing I want to talk about, with mobility, I want to hit on flexibility a little bit. And I want to make this distinction because sometimes people confuse the two. Mobility means wheels. I'm going to put wheels on it, and I'm going to move it. And because it has wheels on it, the student or whoever can move it however, whenever, and do whatever they want with it. If that's the space you have and that's the space you want, then great. Casters are your friend. If you're just saying, oh, I want to rearrange the space every so often, casters are really going to start to work against you. You want to look at the furniture. How does it deconstruct? How heavy is it? Things like that. That's leaning towards flexibility. I'm not going to rearrange it every day. I may even rearrange it, move it every month. If you're moving it once a month, wheels aren't going to be your friend. The furniture is going to end up all over the place. Or it's going to break because you're trying to lock the casters and the you know, students don't unlock lock them, things like that. So when it comes to flexibility, just keeping the things in mind. Okay, how am I gonna? How can this stuff transform, move? You know, when we work on, uh, you know, sometimes people still want long runs of tables for whatever reason. 
you know, we run into a situation where like, oh, well, we're going to move them around. Um, but we'll unscrew them and we'll do this. Like, if you're going to that level, it's never going to be done right. They have to be done as individual tables. They can't be done as 10-foot ones. They probably should be done as 8-foot ones, things like that, to try to make it so you can really have this flexibility in the space. And so with mobile and flexible, like we talked about, so power. So how do I handle the power? You know, I just told you mobile is not a great idea for power. Flexibility, some, there's some challenges with power there as well. Um, so when we look at that, there's now, you know, because this is such a prevalent problem, there's new products coming out there. Uh, Steelcase has a product that runs underneath the carpet. Um, you know, I don't work for Steelcase, so I don't know much about it. Um, but it's interesting. It's trying to tackle the problem that, that everybody runs into. You know, trying to put more power in the space, core the floors is expensive and it's complicated. Um, this is a solution um, that, that addresses that issue. As technology is evolving, uh, Burn is, a, is an electrical company that we work with. All of our units are supplied by Burn. They're, they're experimenting with things like portable batteries, which is very interesting because now I can don't have to rely on cords to transfer the energy. I can rely on a device to transfer the energy. Uh, along the same lines, we're working on a partnership with a battery company as well that will transfer energy. And so these are the types of things, whether it's stuff under the carpet or the batteries, are the stuff that's really coming out for the future because this ability to try to have mobile, flexible rooms and transportation of energy are just kind of, they're, the, both needs are there, but they're kind of opposing each other. So this is creating a great space for new products. And these are some of the new things that are out there I just want to make you guys aware of. So those are the things that um, I want to leave you with for just considering and testing your furniture uh, as you go forward as far as durability and longevity goes. So we talked about four elements here. So we had space, haven, durability, and comfort. And there, you know, there's a psychological side and a functional side. And there's just one last thing I want to touch on real fast, and it's aesthetics. And Jeff was getting at this as well. You have to have aesthetics or the whole thing falls apart. If the room isn't inviting and the furniture is great or the room is really inviting and the furniture is not, it falls apart there. You have to have, you know, this is a great space. Do you want to work here or would you rather work here? I mean, it's a simple answer. Would you rather work in a cage or in front of a fireplace? Aesthetics play a huge role into drawing people in an environment and feeling comfortable. You know, would you rather work at this carol or this carol solution? It's pretty obvious. You know, what study room would you rather work in? Which one's more inviting? What's going to be more conducive for people to focus in? So the aesthetics binds it all together. And with that, keeping all of that in mind, it's all about balance. So, you know, we talked about single user solutions with privacy, without. It's all about balance in the space. You can't have one of everything. You have to have a little bit of a lot of things. So thanks, everybody. All right. All right. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, Jeff. Um, this is Mark from ACRL and Choice. We've got a few minutes here left at the end of the hour for um, some of the questions that have come through. So let me just take a quick look through here and see what we've got. All right. So it looks like looks like uh, we've got a question here from Robert, um, and Robert asks, how do libraries best compete with spaces like Starbucks, food diners, and the students' own dorms and apartments as the best place to come to study and collaborate? And maybe I'll, I'll throw that one at, at you, Jeff, first. Do you have any ideas about that? Yeah, sure. I, that is a, a, one of the fundamental challenges, I think. Um, one of the ways we've seen that libraries compete with Starbucks is sort of to become the competition. In other words, at the Virginia Commonwealth University's Central Library, they have a Starbucks in the library, and so that brings people into the library there, and it actually is the highest grossing Starbucks in Richmond, Virginia. That doesn't always work, however, because it does take a certain uh, amount of traffic to make that be successful. But we can, nevertheless, capture that environment. We can create that space. And how do we become more popular than Starbucks? We do it better is the answer. We, we go study, look, learn, listen, and see what works there and incorporate that into our planning, but do it one step up. Starbucks is great, but how can you actually have a group 
uh, conversation in a Starbucks, or how can you have 10 group conversations in a Starbucks? Library environment can, can capitalize on those, those furnishings, those arrangements, but begin to shape them for you know more enhanced uh, discussion and, and make better acoustic isolation, have more comfortable chairs, et cetera. The Starbucks really actually don't want you to spend that much time. They want the next customer in. So we can do it like they like Starbucks, uh, but better is, is it would be one way to do it. Great. Yeah, Jeff, you bring up a great point. Um, you, you know, I think Starbucks' goal and mission is to make money by selling coffee. Their goal is not to create an environment for someone to work in. So I wouldn't sell sell yourself sell the library short. Um, and yes, Starbucks kind of your competition, but really the academic library is there to provide a space for someone to work in. And because that is your goal, um, like Jeff's saying. You're able to do it better. Like Starbucks is going to have space constraints, and they have to have provide so much retail space and food or whatever. So it's congested. It's it's not comfortable. Yes, someone may stop in and grab their coffee, but nobody necessarily wants to work there. Well, they would rather work in a space where, hey, I can sit and feel comfortable and relax and focus. And through the furniture and the architecture, that'll really make the difference. If you go and look at the furniture at Starbucks, it's not great because they want to turn the next customer. For you guys' space, you're building beautiful spaces, you're putting great product in it, that'll really drive that difference. Right, and then accommodating the competition with the dorm room, uh, that's, uh, the dorm room is popular because you have all your resources around you, and frankly, you can get away from everybody else. Um, to a certain extent, it's sort of the expanded version of one of those Agati pod uh, type carols, uh, gives you that sort of enclosure of separation, you separating you individually from the rest of the campus, um, and gives you enough elbow room to like have all your stuff with you too. So um, those are some of the ways I think that the library can begin to co uh, compete with the dorm room. Certainly, having you know individual quiet study rooms would be a, a, a thing that a lot of students would clamor for. But usually, the library facility resource budget doesn't allow it to build, you know, a group, a, a, an individual quiet study room for, you know, 10% of the population even. Yeah. Great, great. Thank you both for, for the answers. Um, we got another question here. We'll keep moving right along um, from Amy who asks, uh, with the popularity of standing desks in offices, are you seeing any interest in standing desks for public spaces for longer work periods than maybe 10 or 15 minutes or so? And would you like to jump in on that, Joe? Uh, sure, yeah, that's a great question. Um, yes, we, we do get a lot of requests for, well, I guess maybe not a lot is the right word, but it comes in ebbs and flows for requests for sit-to-stand desks. Um, there's nothing wrong with them. And I have, I have strong personal opinions, and I, I emphasize the word personal. Um, in that, um, as far as the front office goes, but we'll focus on just the public side. I, I recommend there's two types of furniture. There's the sit furniture and there's the stand furniture. When you try to get a product to do both, they kind of suck at both of them. You get one that really works great for sitting and you get one that really works great for standing. And it now might seem simple. Well, the table just goes up and down. Well, it, yes and no. I mean, one, you're dealing with a mechanism in a public space. So how often is that thing going to go up and down, up and down, up and down? Um, and the next thing is like, well, now we're in the public space. It's not an office. Now we have to run power, and you know, we, you know how are, you know you have to accommodate everybody to work there. So you know, there could be some confusion on how to use it, and it gets misused, things like that. So usually we recommend to to people that let's really talk about what you want to achieve, and come back to the work activity. Is it a sitting area where you're going to sit low? Is it a high top table where you're going to sit at? or is it a table where you're going to stand at? Um, and I usually recommend doing two separate ones. That seems to work out the best over the long term because it comes, comes back to that mechanism component. How fast and when is that going to wear out? And it makes the product really expensive um, in, in, in that fashion. And Jeff, was there anything you would like to add to that? Or No, I think Joe's had that one covered. Thanks. All right. Great. Great. Um, the next question that we've got here is from Peter, and Peter asks, what percentage of lounge work and work lounge furniture should the library have? Um, and if I yeah. can add on to that, is there is there a bit of uh, is there a similar ratio for um, individual workspace and for a group workspace? How do you come to those decisions? I 
right. That's a difficult one, but usually there's a process of working with uh, the people in the library who have seen what students currently do and 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 know some of their frustrations and the kind of uh, environments that they're not finding. But if you're in the context of a project to create a new library or to comprehensively renovate a library or a floor of a library, one of the useful tools um, to do is to provide a variety of, of these seating and, and, and group versus individual uh, options, but don't fill up all your space. Only buy you know half or 75% of the furniture to fill that space and see what's popular and buy more of what's popular and fill in the voids. So that's, a, that's one reasonable technique. And getting it right in the first pass, more or less right, is, uh, you know, to, to make a, a, have a survey of the students. Um, and that can be a graphic survey or a physical sample survey as well. Yeah, you know, um, th th those are great suggestions, Jeff. And I, I would just add on to that and say, you know, it, 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 it kind of depends on the institution um, as we as we find and this is actually this is actually a great question because it's something that I have been wrestling with and um, we've been kind of working on and probably is going to be our, our, our next webinar um, is that we're noticing that that percentage while you need to have cores of, of, a, of how much work and how much lounge um, probably skew a little bit more towards work than lounge in an academic setting because there's just going to be more working done there. Um, but it seems to also be culture driven as well. So different institutions may skew heavier. For example, we do a lot of work with the University of Chicago. So they tend to put in a lot more single user space and they're really good at knowing the culture of their students and the work pattern of their students to the point that I kind of even asked them like, it seems like you're going a little overboard with this and no. Single users, they love it. This is we observe them working the way this way all the time. Da, da, da. And so they, you know, they know their institution better than I do. They're there every day. They see it. They're, you know, and they're very observant uh, of their space. And you go down there, and yes, they're exactly right. It's very much focused work. If you go to uh, a university uh, like South Florida University, um, you, you know, when I go into that space there. Um, it's a lot more work, people working socially. So still a lot of work getting done, but more in groups. Not that they're working on the same problem, but it's more like, hey, I want to work next to my friends or things like that. Um, so there's also this other component of culture, which we didn't talk about here. We're kind of trying to study more to better answer that question because it's not hard and fast rules. There are some kind of observant and subjective kind of things you need to take into consideration. Great, thank Great. you. Thank you. Um, we've got a, another question here. I think we've got time probably for one or, or two more questions. Um, we'll, we'll try to get to two. Uh, Norma asks, have you focused on spaces that encourage interactions with staff um, as opposed to spaces and furniture for students working on their own or in their student groups? I know in the presentation there's a bit of the discussion around oval spaces and circular spaces for um, working with uh, staff? Are there other ideas that you have about that? Generally speaking, when we're configuring space for uh, faculty or staff to work with students, one of the critical things is to make sure that the environment is completely transparent, uh, that everything can be readily observed uh, that goes on in these spaces, and then to try and set up space that, again, facilitates the conversation. Um, but it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation, and that's different from a collaborative group conversation. The one-on-one -on -one conversation is either we're sitting across from one another because we need to have that kind of interaction, or else we're sitting next to one another because we're sharing content that needs to be uh, seen by both parties at the same time. Um, and then I think as we look at some, uh, some of what Joe has done to making sufficient separation between these things can be achieved not only with architecture, which is re relatively permanent and inflexible, but with furnishings. And Joe, you could elaborate on that. Yeah, that's a good point, Jeff. I, I, that's what I was going to say is that, you know, I think we're, we're you know, I, I've only been here for five years, so I'm, I'm hoping I'm catching the tail end of it, but we're getting less, seeing less and less see of the spaceship desks, these giant things in the middle of a library that these, they create these big barriers that say, don't come talk to me, I got a big desk in front of me, you can just stay over there. Um, so in these situations, bigger is not better. Um, it, it's very intimidating to approach this large desk with one person sitting behind it, maybe you know far away from it. 
Um, is that person really supposed to help me? Are they not supposed to help me? Um, the furniture can play a big part in that. Smaller is better. Um, and then talking was uh, building on some of the principles like Jeff talked about. How is that person going to interact? Is it across to me? Is it next to me? Um, I guess when you're thinking about those and saying, okay, I want to have people interact with me more, just think about how do you like to interact with people? You walk into a space, how do you want to interact with, with someone that you have to ask questions? And you can probably start to build a good sense of what's going really going to work in there. Um, but yes, moving away from the large, big reference service desk, things like that, um, is a big help. It's a big help. It creates a much more inviting atmosphere. Great, thank you. Um, and I think we'll we'll end with one last question here from from Peter, and he says, uh, "Agati furniture is very contemporary in design. Would it work in a traditional formal space like a large square room with a high ceiling, or maybe to add on to that?" If you have one of those big traditional library spaces, um, what are some things that you can do to, to make it feel a little more contemporary or, or a little more inviting? Mm -hmm. uh, I can I can answer the, the furniture side and I can hand it over to Jeff. So that's a great question and I, I get it a lot. And um, what's great about it is, you know, and I apologize, I, rasped, I, I rushed through the last few, few minutes uh, of the slides because I want to leave time for questions, is that all of these principles we're talking about are just innate to human behavior. So it's not like, oh, I walk into a traditional library aesthetic and now I don't have to have this feeling of haven. It just that doesn't go away. Um, and that's why we layer on aesthetic at the end. So for example, I showed you those, um, those kind of new take on the study carols. So the reason why we have a more rectangular one is because with that, while well, yes, you're sitting in there and it's maybe not the very traditional view of a study carol, we can layer a traditional aesthetic over that. So that's why I tell people like, yes, I know you may have a traditional library, but that doesn't mean you should just put tables all across the library because you observe the inefficiencies of them. Let us, you know, you know, my company, other companies that do things what we do, should be able to take the functionality you need to have and layer the aesthetic that you need to have on top of it. Um, and then I don't know if you want to speak to the architecture side of that, Jeff. Well, sure. There's there's opportunities to create a blended environment um, or one that, that creates special places by contrast. Uh, that can be very useful because we know something is a traditional environment. We see it by contrast to something that isn't. That helps. So that's another way of dealing with it, uh, together with creating a kind of a homogenous environment. So I, I think that in a uh, historical, traditional room, elements of, of, of modern uh, accommodation can be inserted within that, or as you say, Joe, just cloak it appropriately, put the right aesthetic on it, and still achieve all of the uh, functionality uh, that you're seeking. All right. Well, thank you very much for, for the answers to all of these questions that we've got, and we have certainly more questions than we have time today to answer, so thank you for all of your questions and for listening in. Um, we will pass those along to the speakers so that they have them. Um, and at the end of our session today, I just want to say thank you, uh, Joe, and thank you, Jeff, for taking the time to present to us today. Um, we, there's a lot of information here, and I know that uh, we've gotten several comments from people letting us know how much they appreciate um, the information that you shared, so thank you very much for that. I'll also offer a quick reminder for everybody on the line today. We did record today's presentation, so please do be on the lookout for a follow-up email from ACRL and Choice with a link to the recording. And thanks again to everyone out there today. I hope you enjoyed the session and that you have an excellent afternoon. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.